I want to speak to us today on Endure to the End. We're continuing um, on the teaching and uh, the ministry of Jesus, eschatology according to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, eschatology is the study of end time events, last days. You know, everyone would like to know what's going to happen in the future and thank God he is the God who's eternal. He's everlasting to everlasting. He knows the end. He knows everything. Amen? Amen. All right. So we began this last week in Matthew 24. <clears throat> and so for our um, text, we'll read Matthew 24, 1 to 14. 1 to 14. The Bible tells us here that Jesus left the temple and was going away. Can you read it with me, please? When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, <coughs> See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. I'm from Guyana and there's a rumor of war coming from Venezuela to Guyana. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place <coughs> but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning, the beginning of the birth pains. You know, a woman goes into labor, she has Braxton Hicks contractions those months before, and then coming, there's false labor, and then there's a real deal, right? Which thankfully no man would experience. <clears throat> um, the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And then the end will come. The end will not come because of climate change. The end is going to come because when God says, okay, that's it. Father, I pray today that you will anoint the ministry of your word. You will break your word to the hearts of your saints. You will minister to everyone. You will bring enlightenment. You will bring understanding. You will bring revelation. You will bring strength. You will bring hope. And let us know, Lord, that our hope and our confidence, they rest in you. Christ is our firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. Minister to us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Endure to the end. So last week, as we began looking at this chapter, there are four points made. One, many will be led astray. Secondly, we said there will be worldwide catastrophes like um, famines and earthquakes and pestilences and so on. Thirdly, you will be hated. You will be hated by all and then many are going to fall away. Many will fall away. Then let's move on to verse 12 where it says, Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Jesus is linking these two things together. So the next thing we see here is the increase in lawlessness. An increase in lawlessness. Lawlessness is a state of disorder that is due to a disregard of the law. And think about it, how many countries in the world how many nations of the world, this is a growing problem where citizens disregard the law. And you know, if you disregard the law, they, they're cost, laws are there for a reason. God's commandments, the Ten Commandments, they're there for a reason to protect us. 
Not to keep us in bondage. It's to protect us. Laws are there to protect you. And laws are there to protect someone else from you and your misbehavior. Isn't that so? Yes. It's not just about me. I've got to respect other people in the society in which I live. You cannot drive through a school zone going at 80 kilometers an hour. You're putting people's lives at risk. You cannot drink and drive. You're putting people's lives at risk. And um, it doesn't take long, listen, for the, law, for the godless to become lawless. It doesn't take long. So when a society pushes God out, when we shove God out of society, it is not long before we head into lawlessness. You know, because we become God when we push God out of society. We call the shots. We make the rules. And God's word, you know, reveals so much to us about ourselves. But let's talk. If the word of God reveals God to us. It tells us about the nature of God. He's eternal. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. Um, he's omnipresent. You know, he's the all-knowing God, the all-powerful God. He's everywhere. He's, <coughs> he's holy. He's faithful. He's just. He's good. The Word of God tells us about the world under the control of Satan, dominated by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The Word of God tells us about um, Satan, he's evil, he's wicked, he's the arch enemy of God and man, he's a deceiver, a liar, and a murderer. But the word of God also tells us about man. We have this propensity to lawlessness. We were created in the likeness and image of God. We all inherited a nature of sin from Adam. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and they've fallen short of the glory of God. Jeremiah 17 and 9 tells us this, that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Amen. Desperately wicked. Paul says in Romans 3, none is righteous. No, not one. No one who understands. No one who seeks God. And then Jesus said in Matthew 15 and 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So out of the heart comes all this evil and wickedness. Now, some of you may, be, may have been on the receiving end of such from someone else. You see, man is so wicked today that this is what we do. We blame God for the evil in the world. That's what it's coming to. Not only do people say, well, there is no God. People begin to maybe mock and scoff at God. But soon you will see the tide turning where men are actually trying to fight against God. That's what the scripture says. Let me give you an example. You know, protest. You know, it's wanting to protest, you know. You, you go and you have an issue you're <coughs> concerned about. Let's protest. Whether it's political protest, one for climate change, various conflicts. But soon these protests will happen. They become violent. And you put other people at risk. And then people are, are beaten and stuff like that. Now that's, that's not good anymore. You see, there, there, there are people in the world who think, you know what? We will try to achieve our goal at any cost. And it doesn't matter who gets hurt. We, want, we have a good cause. But we're going to do something bad to end up with that good cause. Are you getting me here? The end justifies the means. No, no, no. <coughs> Man will use evil to achieve good. So Jesus tells us about this lawlessness. Lawlessness that will be increased in the world. Many of the things that are happening in our countries, you know, various countries of the world are happening now, decades ago, they wouldn't happen. They were unheard of or they weren't happening at the rate and with some, they're so brazen, they're so open. They would have happened in those days. Lawlessness will be increased. But Jesus not only predicts that lawlessness, he also tells us about the consequences of lawlessness. He says, because lawlessness will be increased, what? The love of many will grow cold. Cold. When you read the ancient writings, devotionals, the emphasis of the saints is on holiness, sacrifice, Commitment to God, service to God, yielding and giving up. Just giving, making sacrifices for God. And they all reflect a very deep, passionate, 
heartfelt love for the Savior. So songs like, Oh, How I Love Jesus, just flow from the lips of these saints. But today, our writings are going in the opposite direction. It's not man's love and service devotion to God and giving to God. It's God, what can you do for me? And we present, and actually we come for it in the next lesson we, series we're doing, and the ISOM talks about this thing here in evangelism, right? I hope I can get it right and sure if you didn't put this in my notes. But, you know, we've done evangelism, in, we've turned evangelism all around, you know, in, in, the, in the 20th century, heading into the 21st. It's like a guy on an airplane, and he's heading, you know, to a destination, and there's this parachute, and you're telling him, okay, well, one person tells him, put it on, it's going to make your flight better, more comfortable. You know, you will enjoy the, the flight. He puts it on. People begin to laugh at him, mock at him. He's uneasy. He's not comfortable, of course. Those seats are small. You don't have enough leg room. And after they start to laugh at him and so on, he says, you know, this thing isn't working out. I'm going to take it off. And just fly the way I'm flying. You give another man the parachute and say, you know what, this plane is going to crash. 10,000 feet up in the air, keep this parachute on, you'll be safe. The same parachute, the same plane, two different people, but they're using that parachute for different reasons. We present the gospel and many times we tell people, come to Jesus, your life will be easy. You're not going to have problems. You know, you're going to have, listen, come to Jesus, your life will be filled with peace and joy. And, and that is true. But that's not the objective of serving God. There will be some. But if we tell you, listen, there is a hell and there is a heaven. We will face the wrath of God one day. We'll be judged because we're sinners before God. And the gospel is what saves us. That's our parachute. You better keep it on. Are you getting me here today? Yeah. Two different reasons. So the saints of old, they give their lives to God. And it's not what... God can do for them and God is going to bless me and my life is going to be hunky-dory. I'm going to be so happy and you know, not going to be any problems and Jesus is going to deliver me all the time. And That's not quite what the scriptures say. You see, when sin takes a hold of our heart, we lose our love for God. You know, we come to the church of Ephesus. We abandon our first love. We abandon our love for God. Instead of our love, our hearts growing warm and, and, and falling in love with Jesus more and more, it's growing cold. We know that God loves us. We know that he's gracious. We want his blessing. But we, we disregard his lordship over our lives. We disregard his commandments. We disregard his desires. Listen to me, beloved. God is not our genie in the bottle. We do just call upon Jesus to be at our service. We are at his service. It's his word that has jurisdiction of our lives. It's his commandments that we obey. We serve God because he is God. There's no other way. There's no other way. Can we just focus this week ahead and say, God, okay, I'm not coming in prayer to you for not anything, but I just want to love you and god would you help me to love you more help me to surrender to you give you my life my worship my thanks my gratitude just focus on that in your devotional time this week lord help me to love you and serve you and use me i'm at your service you see when god pours his agape love into your heart it's going to flow effortlessly to those around you you'll find good words kind words to say to people and encourage them. When they come at you and they're angry and upset, you will have the patience and the grace of God to calm them down. Your workplace or clients or whatever it is, you know. <coughs> Jesus, the love <coughs> of many will grow cold. But Jesus didn't stop there. He exerts and he says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. 
the one who endures to the end will be saved. You and I, we have to endure the persecution, the tribulation, the hatred of others, the falling away of those who are around us, the allurement of sin and lawlessness. We're going to encounter hardship and difficulty in our lives. Because in this world, you said, you will have tribulation. So if you're going through a tough time, if you're going through a rough time in your life, there's some tribulation, don't say, oh God, why? Ask God, oh God, why not? I'm just like everyone else. I'm not above, you know, this other brother, this other sister, you know, that I shouldn't have problems. And it's those problems that really make us. They test our faith. Amen? When God takes you through the trial and the tribulation, it's an opportunity for him to work out his holiness, his righteousness, his grace, his strength, and his glory in your life Amen. and my life. We don't like it. I know. And we don't want it. But it's the best. Amen. It's the only way. <clears throat> when we encounter those hardships and difficulties in our lives, we must endure, or as you heard, the famous words, you must stay the course. Stay the course. You know, we used to sing a song back decades ago. I am determined <coughs> to hold on to the end. Jesus is with me. On him I can depend. I know I have salvation way down in my soul. I am determined to hold on to the end. You know, sometimes you feel like giving up. Sometimes you feel like throwing in a towel. Say, that's it. But I heard one pastor say, whenever you reach the end of your rope, rope tie a knot and hold on. Mm -hmm. You know, one time in the Bible, there are many people who turned away from Jesus. The Bible says, after this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. It tells me something. You know, one of the things as an aspiring pastor, you say, you tell yourself, you know, I want to try my best that no one would leave the church and no one would walk away from faith and no, you know, be the best pastor I can be. That, you know, people are going to keep holding on to Jesus. When I read something like this, <clears throat> Pastor Jesus, the Bible says what? Many of his disciples turned back and they no longer walked with him. Even with Jesus, they turned away. I can't do better than that. So Jesus said to the twelve. Do you, he turned to the disciples and the apostles now, he said, do you want to go away as well? Are you going to turn away from me too? And Simon Peter, you see, this is what we got to think about. Lord, to whom shall we go? Ask yourself, when you're turning away from God, what am I turning to? Is there anything that the world has better to offer me? We have to endure like Joseph. <clears throat> all the disappointments, the trials, the tribulation, the suffering. We have to be like Paul who said at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. It's a fight. It's a battle. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. I did not give up. This life, we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a warfare. Amen? Amen. It's not easy all the time. There are times, yes, it's going to be easy. There are times you're up at the mountaintop, but there are times you're in the valley and you're struggling. But I want you to know the same God who's, who will keep you and who gives you joy in the, the mountaintop is the same God who's going to give you strength in the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Hebrews tells us, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, witnesses, and he was talking about the witnesses in heaven. Some of their witnesses on the earth too. And in heaven, he says, let us also lay aside every weight. Lay aside the weight. There are things in life. Listen to me. This is what he was telling the people here in the book of Hebrews. Lay aside the weight. You know, some of us are carrying some weights that are holding us back. The reason why you can't, you, you look at athletes, they would wear the skimpiest clothing they can. Nothing to hold me back. They're playing a sport, they're running, you know what? They, 
no heavy jackets and, and you know, and do whatever. You're not going to wear those things. Or you have to walk a distance. You want to, you have to go walk a, lo a long way, a journey. You have a backpack. You want to empty that backpack of anything that's unnecessary. You're traveling now. You want to find this lighter suitcase. Isn't that so? Right? See what? So you throw, lay aside the weight. In our lives as believers, many of us, we're carrying around weights, things that are holding us back from making um, spiritual progress. And you know what they are. We're just turning a blind eye to them. I don't need to tell you. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got the Word of God. And God has spoken to you. So that's why, you, you know, people are running and some people are going at a slow pace and there are others who are just, how oh, are they making progress? And I'm just struggling here. Maybe the pastor isn't praying enough for me or the elders not praying enough for me. No, you got some weight. But guess what? I can't take off your weight. And no one else can take off your weight. You've got to take off your weight. Lay aside every weight. And then he says, and the sin. Listen, all weight is not sin. He says, lay aside the weight and the sin. So definitely, sin is going to hold you back. Sin is not just going to hold you back and stagnate you. Sin is going to send you backwards. And that's why in the church you find some people are going backwards. And eventually fall away. He says, um, and let us run, how? With endurance. With endurance. The race that is set before us. There is a race to run, beloved. You and I, we are in a race. I love, you know, the Olympics. I love to look at the, um, the, the track and field, um, the 100 meter sprints and 200. I love relays, you know. I love to see someone come from the back and getting, you know, going up in front. I like that. But one of the best races to look at would be the marathon. The marathon. And our race in Christ in life is the marathon. Amen. You've got to have the stamina, the determination. You're keeping your eyes, your muscles are aching. You know, your leg is cramping. You are thirsty. You are tired. And it's not your legs driving you anymore. It's your head driving you. It's all in the head now. And you know, we have in our, in our lives, set our hearts and keep your eyes. Don't put your eyes on the pastor. Don't put your eyes on the church. You know, somebody give me that terrible reason, that foolish reason. The reason why they leave the church is because of what some brother did or something did or some sister. Oh, please. Please. I always tell people in the church, people are going to hurt you. But you know what? There's a good thing to that. Because it teaches you how to forgive. It teaches you how to grow up. Because that's life. That's life. So, um, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. All right? The Bible says, Look into Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It's not Jesus asking us to do anything that he didn't do. He endured the cross. None of us facing a cross right now, like Jesus, are you? No, we're not. The, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So, keep your eyes on Jesus. This is not the time to give up, beloved, with what's going on in the world. We are almost home. I love that. We're almost home. We're almost home. We're almost at the finish line, touching the tape. And then he goes on to the next sign. He says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. This gospel will be proclaimed worldwide. You see, the Great Commission still holds true as the day it was spoken from the lips of Jesus. Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the Great Commission. This mandate was given to us by Almighty God. However, many Christians, they choose to follow the culture instead of Jesus. The culture says, 
You don't talk about God and you don't talk about religion. Religion is something private. Jesus says, no. Someone was telling me the story the other day about their workplace. You know, it's Christmas time. Some people are celebrating. And they're putting up maybe a Christmas tree or, you know, some decorations, you know. It's Christmas. And they're excited about Christmas. And, and the boss comes around and saying, oh, we must not say Merry Christmas. Um, we must say Happy Holidays because we must be inclusive. Don't you see the contradiction? You're saying you want to be inclusive so you can't say Merry Christmas? That's the opposite. The reason why we say Merry Christmas is because we are inclusive. Or Christians don't mean anything. Christians have got to be smart and saying, Hello, ma'am, sir, we are being inclusive. We must come to Christians in too. Because I'm for sure they have more people who have a Christian. They may not be living for Jesus, but they definitely got a Christian background and they want to celebrate Christmas. Come on. Amen. You see, that approach is from the devil. When they say keep God out of and keep religion out of it, that is from the very pit of hell. What else is going to make Satan happy? Don't talk about God. Canadians, let's talk about the weather. What kind of winter are we going to have? Are we going to have snow? When will the Raptors play? They may lose. Then they win again. Or another season of hockey. Oh, let's talk about these things. They're so important. God? No, no, no. It's God. Not about the Creator. Not the one who gives us life, not the, but the one who keeps us, not the one who gives us joy, not about the one who gives us hope, not about the one who gave his life for us on the cross, not about the one whom we have to stand, for, stand before on the day of judgment, not about the one who was spending and who has got a home in paradise for us. No, let's talk about God. The most important question in life is, does God exist and who is he? And then is the Bible, the word of God. You see, the answer to the question about God affects everything else in life. Should I lie? Should I get married or sleep around? Should I view porn on my, on my laptop? Do I get a divorce or do I work on my marriage? Um, do I get an abortion? Do I pursue um, same-sex attraction? Am I headed for eternity of judgment? Or do I live for God in paradise? The question of God affects every other area of, you know, it even affects whether you pay your taxes or not. Because if you're a God-fearing man or woman, you pay your taxes. You show up to work on time. You don't show up to work 8.30 and you clock in 8 o'clock. Well, it's probably automatic now. There's no way you can cheat, you know. But when you go to work, you work and you don't spend time on social media. You know what I'm saying? Because when you're God, that affects so many things. You would, you would, your, your husband or your wife is going to trust you and, and you will honor them, you're going to respect them and you'll be faithful to them and you have eyes for no one else. And you wouldn't lie, you know, and, and someone give you extra change at, at, the, at the store, you say, hey, you give me extra change here. <laughs> you're supposed to pay the parking, you pay parking. You get a ticket, you pay the fine. You know what I'm saying? Am I? <laughs> <laughs> It affects everything in life, whether you believe in God or not. All right? When you speak, you don't curse and swear and use all sorts of foul language. And you don't have hatred in your heart for people. You see that? Regardless of their country of origin or the level of education or how much money they've got or anything like that. You see, Satan and the world says, don't talk about the important issues of life. Talk about other things. But Jesus said, listen, go and preach the word, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. Amen? Amen. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Pentecostals think, oh, I want the Holy Ghost power so I can feel good in church today, and I can speak more in tongues. He says, you will receive power so you will be my witnesses. Because when you're filled with joy and you're filled with hope and your heart is full of peace and you can walk around, people in the workplace are wondering, what's going to happen to you? What's wrong with you? 
Why are you always so happy? Or are you so peaceful? Why do you get mad at the boss when they railed on you the other day? Oh, I got a piece of God, man. I tell me about this Jesus. The Bible tells us, even in the book of Psalms, he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. In the Psalms, make known his deeds among the people. God wants you to talk about him wherever you go. Amen. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell all of his wondrous works. Just tell people. Now, of course, you've got to be wise in certain workplaces, certain environments. I'm not telling you be foolish. But Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You and I are here to tell the good news. Use the opportunities when they present themselves. Don't shut up. When people talk about God or talk about something, you know, and, hey, can I share my opinion here? You know, put it in nicely and smoothly. You don't have to be, you know, offensive. Be respectful and say, well, this is what I believe. And, and this is what the Bible teaches me, you know. Because they might think that is archaic, that's obsolete. They're not People don't believe the Bible anymore. Oh, yes, we do. Lots of us do. Use, this is another thing you can do. Use your social media to witness. Amen. Your Instagram, Facebook, I, I hear that's old, but I still use it. I'm that generation. Your snappy, chatty thing. You know, whatever, you know, they come up with. Oh, whatever they, the devil brings, TikTok, okay, we're going we're gonna to tick it along. <laughs> we, we're going to TikTok that clock all the way down to when Jesus comes. Yeah, use it. Am I being smart here? Yeah. And a lot of you, you know, your friends, maybe you don't want to talk to them, but share on social media, let them hear the gospel. Amen. Do not be ashamed. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Listen, all of you, I'm going to ask you something. If you have never done this, not now. When you go home today, remember, you do this. When I ask, when we ask many people how they learn about the church and how they visit, you know how they tell us? What they tell us? It's not somebody call them. They go on Google. Google is preaching. They go on Google and they look for churches nearby where I live. And this church comes up. And then you can, they look at the reviews. And that will encourage them to come. So I can ask you to do one thing. Uh, to share the gospel, to share the message, go and write a review. I hope it's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say how tall the pastor is. Just, just, just do a review, right? Um, but that's a way of spreading the word of God. Let people know there's a church nearby that preaches the gospel, that worships Jesus. Amen? People who know how to love on one another and a church where there's unity and you can be um, fed with the word of God. Tell your school friends, your relatives, your workmates about Jesus. You know, have some tracks with you. In my office, I've got tracks. Some of you don't like it, but a lot of people come and they take it. And I would give others, you know. Have a Christian book on your desk. You be smart. You know? Be smart. Just use something so that people, this is someone. Don't just be a silent witness. I mean, but you have these things around. Yes. And but then you're willing to share about Jesus. And let your words and your attitude reflect the goodness and the grace of God. We all share the responsibility of evangelism. And this gospel shall be preached to all the nations. Then the end will come. We have a responsibility, beloved especially in this day and time, especially to show Jesus to the world in which you live. Can we all stand together, please?